screw it up. As the light fades across Sydney's west, little Sahara Hillman Varma is well into her fourth hour of training. Spurred on by her father, the young golfing prodigy is honing the skills that make her one of the most promising talents in the country. We just stay on the putting green and Dad puts around LED floodlights around the green and then I practice then. It's a nightly ritual that ends only after she's nailed the perfect shot. Do you ever say to him, all right, Dad, I think we're getting a bit carried away here, or are you saying to him, yeah, more lights, Dad? <laughs> more lights, Dad. <laughs> At just 12, Sahara's already represented Australia. Now she's determined to turn professional before she turns 16. How often are you playing golf these days? Um, six or seven days a week now. What about school? Um, well, I'll go to school, then I will practice, and then I'll come home, do some homework. If I don't finish, I have to do it at six o'clock in the morning. So you play so much golf at night that you get up early in the morning so you can do your homework before school? Sometimes I have to wake up at 5.30. Do you, do you ever think maybe you're missing out on, you know, a bit of quality childhood, too much golf and not enough time with your friends? It's good to have childhood, but I don't like getting carried away with it because you still have your life priorities and you need to think about that as well. So if you had a choice, play golf or hang out with your friends, what is it? Golf. Sahara's ambitious dreams are shared by her equally ambitious parents, Karen and Vic. Do you think she's just exceptionally gifted or has she been pushed pretty hard? Uh, both. Both. Is there a possibility that, you know, this is straying towards Sahara living out your dreams and not her dreams? They certainly weren't my dreams before. They, they are my dreams now. She doesn't want to be in front of the TV. She doesn't want to be, uh, uh, you know, playing video games. She doesn't want to be doing all that stuff. She wants to be on the grass. You can't keep that kid off the grass. Born with rare talents rivalling those of professional adults, a prodigy or supremely gifted child can often display simply breathtaking skills. But natural ability will only get them so far. And like anyone else, they need to practice if they want to make the most of their gifts. That's where it gets difficult for parents like Karen and Vic, who are often accused of being overzealous and pushing their daughter too hard in the pursuit of glory. Has anyone ever called either of you psycho golf parents? Probably. They're, oh, they probably would, probably. but not to our face. <laughs> you feel it's very much Sahara pushing this? Yes. Well, well we're, we're divorced, so we don't. We, we, we wouldn't spend nearly as much time together um, if if Sahara wasn't playing golf. It's not. I mean, walking 18 holes of golf with your ex is not everyone's <laughs> idea of a fun <laughs> afternoon, or, or 36 or 72 holes of golf. But um, we do it because <clears throat> she wants us to, you know. And, and what, what's not great about that? Like Sahara, piano prodigy Isabella Lou is a little girl with big ambitions. At the tender age of nine, the tiny virtuoso already spends more than 40 hours each week rehearsing, and that's on top of going to school. How much practice do you do? Five to six hours each day, and on the weekends I do six to eight hours. When you wake up in the morning, you play piano before school? Yeah, one and a half hours. Do you think you're going to be famous one day? Probably, if I keep this up. Do you have a dream? Yeah, I want to tour around the world and perform concerts to a lot of people. But her parents, Agnes and Luke, insist that intensive workload is completely their daughter's decision. So for Isabella, 36 hours of school a week, 46 hours of piano practice. Yeah, it's yeah. like a full-time job. Wow. Yeah. It's a lot for a young girl. Yeah, exactly, yeah. But um, she, do she doesn't really seem um, tired. It's like um, when you really like something, you, you don't really feel you, you have been spending so much time on it. Agnes and Luke say their daughter's hard work and dedication are already paying off. 
This year, Isabella became the youngest person in history to headline a performance at the Sydney Opera House. There's no sign of her slowing down anytime soon. Who pushes Isabella more when it comes to practice? Is she quite driven or do you have to crack the whip? Not really. We don't really push her to practice a lot. We actually push her not to practice so much. <laughs> that I said it's the opposite. Yeah. You have to say, please stop. Yeah. <laughs> so sometimes we have to set the, um, the alarm clock and then one, maximum one and a half hour, you need to have a break. Does she have time to socialise? Oh, yes. School time. <laughs> <laughs> School time. <laughs> yeah. There's certainly a stereotype about the pushy parent, uh, particularly in giftedness, but in general, there's no pushing from the parents. There's a lot of pulling from the child, come here and help me with this, and it's really uh, about the parents kind of catching up. Alan Thompson is the head of Mensa International's Gifted Youth Committee. When it comes to prodigious youngsters, he believes it really is the children pushing their parents for more practice time and not the other way around. Is there such a thing as too much practice for, for young children? Yeah, that's a good question. So we still talk about the 10,000 hours of practice to achieve mastery, um, which is a number of years, depending on how many hours you put into it. I think following common sense there and allowing the child to drive it to a certain extent is good. How much do your parents push you? My dad pushes me, but they don't force me. Even though he is really strict on the golf course, he gives me like 50 push-ups all the time. What, if you do a bad shot? Yeah. Dad once made me do 600 push-ups without stopping, and the next day my arms were literally killing me. 600 without stopping? Yep. It's a bit crazy, isn't it? He stood over me and counted. It was very sad, but it taught me a lesson. <laughs> To outsiders, that might seem like a harsh lesson. Right, that's gone to the right. One push up. But Karen and Vic maintain that everything they do is with their daughter's best interests at heart. Has Sahara told us that the record so far is you made her do 600 push ups one day? Uh, 150. <laughs> 600. She said 600. Did you? I'm inclined to believe her. <laughs> That's what like. When I found out that he was making her do push-ups, I was mortified because uh, he, he did it once during a tournament and I just went, oh, and walked off. I, I said, you, you, you actually look like one of those parents now. There's something just to, just to make her focus, bring their focus back to her studies and golf and sports and life that, um, you know, when you do something wrong, there are consequences. You'd be aware of overbearing parents like a Demir Dokic or something. I mean, you, you, do you see that and think, OK, I need to make sure I don't end up like that? There are some parents like that, but not us. <laughs> I don't make a do push-ups. <laughs> <laughs> Every child is different, and Paul and Leanne Hopkins are only too aware there are no simple solutions when it comes to nurturing their talents. At just 13, their son Nathan boasts an IQ of 137, ranking him in the top 2% of intelligent people on the entire planet. Do you find your intelligence is a blessing or a curse? Uh, in, in some ways it's a blessing, but in some ways it's a curse. So when I get very annoyed at myself a lot that I'm not reaching my full potential. At what age do you think Nathan became smarter than both of you? Ooh. When he was born. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, you. We do explain to Nathan, you know, we're not stupid. But there are some things that we do know as parents that he doesn't yet, and there's other things that he knows that we don't, so we try and yes, be a bit of a team. Most of the time, Paul and Leanne say they're just trying to keep up with Nathan. Yeah. And are more than happy to let him lead the way. Right now, that means supporting Nathan's attempts to break the world record for solving a Rubik's Cube. Pretty impressive. 14 seconds. I see parenting a gifted child as a, a dance with two partners, uh, one being the parent, the other being the child, and it's about trying to find the same song and the same dance steps together and adjusting. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important 
for them not to be held back from their own abilities. So I was always just trying to meet Nathan wherever he was at and run with it. How much do you push Nathan and, and how much is he a self-starter? If he's interested in it, you don't need to push him at all. Hmm. If he's not interested in it, bulldozers are not going to move him too far. <laughs> <laughs> Alan Thompson agrees it's important for parents to strike a healthy balance and remember that the one thing all children need is a childhood. It is hard, you have to remind these kids sometimes, go and hang out with your mates. <laughs> Absolutely, I think they, they get called by whatever their obsession is. That, that might be a, a chessboard calling to them to come over and play with the pieces or a Rubik's Cube so that they can memorise all the different opening algorithms, um, but allowing them to also bring their body back into it for physical translation of intelligence is useful, allowing them to play because uh, they're not going to be a child forever. But it's not always that easy to divert a child prodigy away from their true love. Even when Isabella Lou isn't practising for her next recital, she spends most of her time at the piano, teaching the next wave of prodigies like her equally talented four-year-old sister, Ella. Is she a good student? Sometimes. <laughs> Ella, who is the best piano player you know? <laughs> uh, is she better than you? No, <gasps> definitely not. Not, not, not. Whatever lies ahead for these prodigies, Oh, nice. One thing is for sure, their determination to succeed oh, that is how it's done. will never fade. Do you feel like there might come a time, you know, when you're older, when you think, you know what, maybe I spent a bit too much time on golf when I was young? Not really. I think that if you don't have like a priority in life, then what's the point of it? You need to devote some hours to what you want to do. Have you thought about what happens if you don't ever get that good? I'll keep practicing <laughs> until I get better. Hello, I'm Tara Brown. Thanks for watching. To keep up with the latest from 60 Minutes Australia, make sure you subscribe to our channel. You can also download the Nine Now app for full episodes and other exclusive 60 Minutes content.